One, March 2003, Ballyvore, County Meath, Ireland. The operator of a peat milling machine on an industrial extracting bog, peat harvest, a tragically ironic term for this unsustainable process in County Meath, Ireland, pokes into the inner workings, a blockage. The machine is ground to a halt, perhaps bog oak, common enough in some of the bogs. Not this time. Something else, it looks like leather. No, human remains, remains being entirely appropriate. The torso of a man, the lower body, legs cut away, milled into fragments, mixed into the peat heading for domestic power stations. And this is just a trigger warning. If anyone's um, troubled by images of human remains, please look away now. The discovery, if this word is appropriate, of the corpse subsequently, subsequently christened Clonny Cavern Man, a later prehistoric bog body. A blockage in the machine, a machine designed to extract carbon rich peat for domestic energy supply, a strange and macabre harvest. The system frozen in its tracks, if ever there was a metaphor for the Anthropocene. Okay, so that's just a short introduction. Um, this uh, paper, this presentation is, um, I think it's going to be interesting. Uh, when I was asked to speak, I wasn't quite sure what I would talk about. The theme was plants, which obviously is extremely broad. Um, and I started writing down thoughts and ideas over the last few weeks. Actually, I've included it on the screen there. You can probably see just, um, it was a Google Doc I started writing things into. Um, kind of went all over the place. So what I've tried to do is, is pull some of these ideas and thoughts together. So there are plants in here and the various three themes running through. Um, if, if the paper has a title, the title is this, The Whole Strange Growth, which is itself a citation of a citation from um, a paper by Patricia Cochran, who's a professor, Emeritus Professor of English here at uh, UCC. And it's actually a quote from Seamus Heaney um, and I don't know if you can maybe read it there on the screen. Um, it's from Heaney's translation uh, of Orpheus. So that you couldn't tell if the whole strange growth were a wood or a women in distress or both. So the, the talk, the presentation, whatever it is, kind of has four bits. Um, I'm, I'm gonna read for some of it off a script, which for some of you who might have heard me speak or ramble before, it's quite unusual for me and there's various reasons for that, but I won't be speaking off a script completely. There's, there's kind of four sections interspersed with some uh, discussion, I suppose, and um, we'll come on to that in a minute. So the first part, uh, Ballyvore, we've just heard, then we'll have uh, Curraheen River Run, Gluxman Gallery, and we'll finish with Castle Freak Woods. Um, just a request, and as we go along, um, hopefully um, uh, my colleague Susie will post a link to a Padlet onto the group. I don't know if you've come across the Padlet before. It's essentially a kind of open access uh, virtual uh, board. You can post onto it. Um, you can post uh, anything really, uh, links, ideas, thoughts. Um, I think the link should go into the, into the chat. Um, I'd be very keen as we go through, and again, don't feel compelled. You can post anonymously or not. Any thoughts or ideas about anything that we talk about, please add them to the, to the Padlet. And we'll leave the Padlet open after the talk. Um, so hopefully that link is now in the in the um, in the chat. There'll also be a few other links posted that relate to some of what I'm going to talk about. So I, I'm not quite sure what this paper is about, other than plants, which kind of link it. Um, but I think flowing through some of this is something that we've talked about and worried about a lot in archaeology and paleoecology recently, and that's I suppose uh, value and worth. Um, I suppose in the Anthropocene, but more broadly. Um, and there's other kind of words that I think come through here and I hope in a constructive way. And this is from Felix quote, this entanglement also means a deep past and shallow weighs in on the present. The papers we write, the courses we teach, the exhibitions we stage, the past affects the present, affects the future, makes a difference. I've put makes a difference in bold because that's something I'm gonna come back to at the end because I sometimes, worry that the kinds of value and the differences that we maybe think about 
I wonder whether we can think about those uh, more broadly, but that's something I'll come back to. Um, I should also note that that was a very kind introduction by, by Felix. Um, all the work I've been involved in recently is very much involved other people. And there's just a few voices who are in this, voices and influences are in this talk. That's, that's my brother, Professor Adam Geary, um, Rosie Everett, who's my colleague on Wet Futures amongst, amongst other projects. Um, Maureen O'Connor, who's a lecturer in the um, School of English here um, at UCC. Um, some of the members of the Palace Boy project team there that I, we touch on very briefly later on. So that's uh, Kathy Moore, Mark Griffiths and Brian McDonnell, and also Orla Peach Power. So there are these voices in here, but as, as they always say, any errors or confusion is completely up to me. Also last, but by absolutely no means least, is my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Su Dr. Susie Richer. Um, and I've asked Susie to just read a brief passage to kick off the next part of the talk. Um, this is a poem by the Irish poet Anne-Marie Nicoran. I may have mangled that name. It's from her collection, Bloodroot. Um, the poem is untitled. At this point, I will hand the mic over to Susie. The first time a tree called me by name, I was 13 and only spoke a weave of ordinary tongues. It started with a leaf and next a mist came down from the hills, beating a lonely skin drum. Scarlet pimpernels dropped hints that could not be ignored. No red is innocent. Badger trails called me aside for a word. Come underground, they said. See what we are made of. Thank you, Susie. The pressing question, it seems to us, is how, as human scientists, we are to produce knowledge amid a growing realisation that those boundaries are pasted across objects which are quite indifferent to a bureaucratic division between disciplines, and that scholars and researchers of all stripes invariably attend to and live among objects whose emergence, growth, development, action and disappearance do not at all admit of neat cuts between the biological and the social or between the cerebral and the cultural. Fitzgerald and Kellard, 2015. We'll post the references for anyone who's interested. Another quote. An important precondition of our argument is a notion that any theory always holds potential for something more than what it was meant to be and more than what it is doing right now. I'm gonna try the name. Please forgive me if I get it wrong. Petorus de Tier, is that right? I'm sorry if I've mangled it. And Olson, 2018, fantastic paper. So um, something we talk about and worry about a lot is how we might define the start of the Anthropocene. And of course, there's many debates about that. It also seems in vogue for us to have various scenes um, and to coin various terms. So I'm going to coin one today, ladies and gentlemen. I was thinking of calling it the uh, academic scene, but it might be better called the angst scene. This is a Google engram plotting um, the use of the word Anthropocene. Again, you can see the, um, you can see the curve there. Again, as paleoecologists um, and archaeologists, we're kind of obsessed with curves and particularly curves that go up, which generally Anthropocene are, are generally bad things. So that brings me on to number two, Curraheen River Run, Cork City. April 2020, three months into lockdown, Cork, Ireland. The world has shrunk to a five kilometre radius of home. Running has become an essential part of my mental and physical coping strategy. I'm out, halfway around the usual loop. I turn onto the path by the Curraheen River, where my eye is caught by something in the grassy verge. A patch of ribwork plantain. Plantago lanceolata, rat's tails, slan loose, slon, oshguelka, slon, cheers. A plant of grassy places, never grows in woodland. Animophilus, wind pollinated. Pollen, polypantoporate, many pores. Identification goes to species. Beloved of paleoecologists, the increase in this plant is an indicator of human activity in pollen diagrams from Northwest Europe, especially from the Neolithic onwards. One possible start of the great acceleration. But it wasn't the plantain that stopped me to take a photograph. There are many fine specimens along the riverbank. A discarded plastic glove lying next to the long waxy leaves. COVID-19 littering, 
alongside the usual detritus of the capitalocene, a receipt, a sweet wrapper. Anthropogenic indicators from the prehistoric to the great pandemic of 2020, 2021. Let's hope it stops there. Uh, proxies, pollen, beetles, plants, sedimentary DNA. Um, the roots is from the Latin procura procuratio, a management, a caring for. Encrypted in our practice is a caring for, for what and for whom. Of things, that which takes the place of something else, 1630s. It may be an obvious point, but environmental archaeology is, is imaginative, like most archaeology. Um, it isn't possible to be an environmental archaeologist uh, without imagination. Um, there's a quote here from, again, I, I've put many difficult names in this talk. I don't know what I'm trying to do to myself. Dali Isevich, I'm going to try that. Um, talking about, in this case, about the Jurassic, making the point the Jurassic may now be re reconstructed in imagination, but never again touched, seen or experienced. This might seem like a, a kind of fairly obvious point about the past in general, but I think many other things fall out of it. Um, in a lot of ways, I would suggest that paleoecology is, we might refer to is uh, mimetic. And again, that's a word that's many different definitions over, but I, I was taken with this uh, quote. Um, an act of versification, but also an act of narration, a narrator addressing an audience. This storytelling event, moreover, is of central cultural importance because it's the occasion when the community allows a meaningful past to shape its present. And just to another quote earlier, actually from a paper, 2005, Feldman, um, who refers to um, deep imitation to represent the world in a form that resembles it, while at the same time not being the same thing or even a copy of it. Um, perhaps we should use, maybe ha perhaps some people are more comfortable with the reliably scientific and reassuring term reconstruction of past environments, but the past cannot be reassembled like a jigsaw. The paleoecologist always works with partial sets of remains that have been affected by processes beyond her control, even before they are recovered, recorded, analysed and reimagined. Because, as I've said, paleoecology, like all environmental archaeology, is fundamentally a narrative discipline. Past landscapes are ultimately only reified as imaginative linguistic constructions, but with an extended and unpredictable life of their own. We might regard them as sensual objects following the language of object-oriented ontology. We might even describe them, if, as we practice this, as sticky, a bit like Morton's hyperobjects. We can never quite shake them off or out of our thoughts. Of course, we can identify pollen or subfossil seeds under a microscope but there is always something left out. For all the power of the scientific approach and the remembering archive, there are forms of life that cannot be recovered or deposited in an archive. Strange echoes and parallels may emerge from this if we let them. Some time ago, I read the novel In the Cafe of Lost Youth by Patrick Modiano. Modiano is a practitioner of styles of archivization that trouble the recording eye. His novels return to this peculiar experience. The notebook kept, notebooks kept by his various characters can never capture the events that haunt them. This archive is surrounded by the totality of the past lives that elude it. It is impossible to fully reconstruct the traces of the event that appear to lie behind the novels. Nothing is resolved. Rather, one is left with a disquieting experience, forced to confront, to reread, to rethink, to reanalyze more samples, new techniques. We just need more radiocarbon dates. Time and chronology. As archaeologists and paleoecologists in the Anthropocene, we seem to have too much, but never quite enough. So if we think about a conventional, I suppose, approach to reconstructing past environments, whatever that means, we might think of it in a neat way like this. We analyze our proxies, whatever they are. Um, we apply chronological techniques to them. We utilize an interpretive paradigm, whether we think we do or not. And we end up with something at the top or the bottom, depending on how your flow goes, that is our past environment. And it's kind of a loop in this all the time. 
But what's important here, and something that myself and Susie have talked and thought about a lot, and with other colleagues as well, is the importance of the importance of the imagination. Um, and here's a quote from uh, McFarlane, and this is a piece that McFarlane wrote for a, an exhibition at Victoria and Albert. And we'll just read this briefly. Constable's image is a study of rootedness too, for the elms are among the first inhabitants of the landscape we now call East Anglia. They came to Norfolk, Suffolk and Essex 8,000 years ago, part of the wildwood which came to cover the British Isles during the final centuries of the last ice age, when the glaciers, which for millennia had covered all but the southern parts of the land, began their retreat. To conceive of the history of those years which existed before human record, one has to reset the chronometers of one's imagination and to think, if it is possible, in ice time and in tree time. Um, another example, I, I like this quote, it's my paleo knowledge, Kurt Steger. And this is talking about um, uh, Thoreau and the, the pool that, um, that was next to the cabin where he lived in, where he went to live in the woods very famously. Um, and he's talking about a core, uh, a paleo environmental core from that lake. And he says this, slightly more than 70 centimeters higher above the ground, and that's from the base of the core. We are roughly 75 lifespans into the story when warm, dry climate supported a fire prone mix of savanna grasses, pitch pine, and oak. Some of the oak pollen in this mud may have made a local deer hunter sneeze, spooking a buck he had hoped to take with a stone tipped dart when the animal came to the lake to drink. Now, leaving aside the, um, the gender issue with that, um, with that quote, um, I like this very much because it reminds us that. Um, pollen and pollen grains are always in and of the world, both in the past and in the presence. Um, and again, I think that's, that's important when we think about our proxies, that they're never inert. They act on us as much as we act on them. And I think this reminds us again about the importance of imagination and admitting imagination, and I suppose to an extent something else that's playing in here, for me at least, is, is memory. It's all about these connections. They're always there whether we admit to them or not. And it's interesting sometimes to follow them and see where they take us. I threw this in as well. This is from the last, last piece as well. Um, another kind of, I say, sad and slightly depressing uh, element of the Anthropocene and the fact that the water in the lake here had approximately doubled in terms of its summer phosphorus budget. And that's associated with people swimming and weeing in the lake there. So, moving on slightly, can we think of other ways of framing our analyses? Paleoecology is generally practiced within an implicit, if it's not explicit, Western scientific epistemology. I mean, there are many potential avenues and discussions we could have here. Uh, we could think about this in a problematic way. We might say that this could lead to a form of scientific imperialism where reconstructions of the past are presented as neutrally scientific and socially inactive. Of course, prevailing disciplinary paradigms are always culturally specific and intertwined with dominant power structures such as gender and race. This much is clear. But how to negotiate, navigate, and potentially realign re our work? Again, and this brings us in, I suppose, to discussions of language that I've alluded to already. And we might think in terms of whose language and whose frameworks. Um, obviously, Linnaean systems are common scientific systems and they're a very particular and specific frame of reference for um, discussing uh, vegetation and environment and science more broadly. And that, of course, is important. But we could admit other systems and frameworks into our analyses if only to see where that takes us. And again, there's some quite obvious examples of this, following on from the, the previous slide, um, a shot of, of, of Urtica uh, nettles. Um, this is, some of you may recognize this, this is the, the, um, the bowl from the site of Must Farm. The bowl was preserved when the settlement collapsed with a spoon in it, and the contents of the bowl are nettle stew. So a very obvious example of nettles, anthropogenic indicators, weeds, well, not in this case, of course. And again, this is bringing us around to um, discussions, I suppose, of the way we think about and interpret um, our pollen diagrams and environmental archaeology more broadly, of course, 
Human impact is an extremely important um, concept for us in environmental archaeology. Um, but what else can we do with it and where else can we go? So Leslie Head wrote this in 2008, um, talking about the, the metaphor, human impact. Neither conceptually nor empirically strong enough for the complex networks of humans and non-humans now written in prehistoric as well as contemporary time frames. So at this stage, I'd like to ask Susie to, um, to join the conversation if, um, if she's willing to do so. So again, plants and the way we classify and describe and perceive plants, uh, Rumex napolensis or Shomang, taste, energy, naturally sweet and bitter, parts used, roots and leaves, uses, treatment, imbalances of sores, skin diseases, kidney fever, coughs, nasal bleeding, constipation. Susie, are you there? I am, yes. So this uh, is- I like the- <laughs> Sorry, Susie, go on. No, no, no carry on. <laughs> So just to say, this is, um, so what we're gonna do now, I'm not quite sure we're doing for time, I've slightly lost track. Um, I think we're doing okay. So what we're gonna do now is just talk briefly about this paper that we published um, terrifyingly four years ago now. Um, I'm not sure where the four years have gone. Um, we're just gonna kind of review this in the context of what, what, what I was just talking about. Um, so Susie, sorry, I beg your pardon for speaking over you. No, all I was gonna say was, um, I like the fact that you've started with um, Remax in that, in that in a pollen world it's often considered as a traditional um, anthropogenic indicator something a sign of disturbance but there the way that you were talking about it and the way we talk about it in the article is, is trying to bring up some of these other qualities and these other ways of seeing um, but this um, article really came about from some fieldwork that I undertook in Nepal um, in an even terrifyingly longer period ago in 2013 and 2014 um, and Ben's got the map up there um, of, uh, of Nepal, and you can see where Mustang is. But um, I suppose, is there another slide, Ben? We'll just go on a bit, maybe. Um, so this came out from a, a work that was done, a really good article in that area, not done by Ben or me, um, but was published in 2009 in Mustang. Um, and um, there's no need to understand the detail there from the pollen diagram, but the point really was that prior to about 3500 BC, uh, where that green box is, it's showing a kind of damp woodland, um, a, an area that was really dominated by fir and pine and juniper and, and ferns as well. So we've got this idea of a damp woodland. And then there's quite a dramatic change in the landscape, which is put down to human impact and people coming in and clearing that landscape. And then in the red box, you start to see um, a plethora of little herbs coming in. And that is this, um, very much described as a, a degraded landscape. So you have this idea of something with trees seen as good and pristine, and then people come in and you have this um, kind of progression through degradation. And that there just kind of shows, again, that idea of the, the woodland below and then this degraded land above. But that is coming at it from um, this very Western scientific um, way of looking at that landscape. So what we tried to do was actually go back and look at, um, this sounds a little bit arrogant, but trying to actually understand it from the people who live in that landscape and some of the ways in which the, this landscape could be viewed from um, a different perspective. And for that, we used a traditional medicinal system called sour rigpa. Um, and it was based on um, a medicinal system really that's based in Ayurvedic principles and that goes back um, hundreds, if not thousands of years. It's based on an oral tradition. Uh, and it's a lot more related rather than just medicinal health in terms of um, our physical health, but also our spiritual health and our emotional health too. And different plants are seen in different ways in that tradition. Um, can we go on again? One of the slides. Um, so the Remax slide here is again, just an idea of showing how that is actually seen within this tradition of Sarah Rigpa, um, well, it's given a taste and an energy, not just um, ecological characteristics. It's naturally sweet, it's bitter. And those things are used for, teach, um, for treating imbalances, especially to do with, um, I think that one's associated with um, attachment. Um, so there are things like attachment, um, 
jealousy, all of these more kind of emotional disorders rather than necessarily physical ones as well. But when you come back to the pollen diagram and trying to look at that, suddenly you go from this landscape where there were trees and not many small herbs growing to one where there was a lot of small herbs growing. And it's these small herbs that are used within that um, traditional medicine. So actually you start to kind of flip the picture on its head and you go from a landscape that would have been pretty poor in terms of having these uh, plants available to help your spiritual and physical well-being to suddenly a whole load of them. Uh, and that's just if you take this idea and spin it on its head slightly. So that's a, um, like a really nutshell um, introduction really to the article, but I would encourage you to read it because we do explore these um, ideas a little bit in a little bit more detail really. Um, but the general principle is just trying to go, oh, wait a minute, we can, we can start to look at pollen and plants and trees from different perspectives. We're not just rooted in our own perspectives. Clearly we are, but um, there's no reason why we can't bring other ones into that discussion. Really. I I think, yeah. you want to say about it then? No, I think the important point to note, and this is something we, we discussed when we were writing the article, was the fact that um, clearly you have to be aware of a certain degree of, um, I suppose, um, neither myself nor Susie are, are um, clearly from Nepal, and neither of us are um, practitioners of, of, of Buddhism. I don't know, Susie, maybe you are these days. So we were also aware of the sense of perhaps appropriating indigenous systems of describing vegetation. So that's, that's clearly an issue in here. And just to be entirely clear that hopefully this is coming through, we were really just, I suppose, playing with different ways that we might um, understand and perceive, perceive past landscapes. And this is one that we settled on. There are many others. Again, something that I've become interested in recently is, is for example, folk, um, uh, folk medicine in Ireland and folklore is a, a huge amount of folklore about um, plants, uh, woodland vegetation in Ireland. And again, if you if you start to use slightly different lenses, you start to understand your information in the past slightly differently. And again, this is not, of course, not to reject um, conventional, if you like, approaches to understanding past landscapes or conventional methodologies in environmental archaeology, that is not the intention at all. But I suppose, I suppose, and again, I'm going to read from, <laughs> in a quote, quote, quote from the paper here, um, um, and it says, and we said this, uh, the most important point is that a plurality of interpretations can exist, which can perhaps lead to a more nuanced and richer interpretation of past landscape. Possibly this also foregrounds the concept that landscapes are always composed of discontinuous and contingent histories. That's Caitlin de Silva. It is not possible to examine the multiple inter interconnections that had existed between people in the natural world in the past. But this is not to say they're not without relevance and importance. And we go on to discuss perhaps the more practical um, aspects of this in terms of, and I don't see, I don't know if you want to say anything about that in terms of some of the issues to do with uh, landscape degradation in Nepal and the involvement of local communities in that. Um, I don't know if you want to throw anything in there, Susie, if not, that's fine. Um, yeah, I suppose the, um, there is a, a wider political um, agenda there as well, and it's not a simple landscape where it's uh, one cultural group living there, but there are um, different groups um, and there is a definite hierarchy to those groups as to who can um, determine conservation practices, for instance. So um, these Western voices there are just one voice amongst many, which in, I want to say, a kind of competing field. It's not necessarily competing, but they're certainly rubbing up against each other in a way that's uh, potentially causing conflict in, in some places as to how, how these landscapes are managed or whether they even should be. And who has that right to, um, to dictate the ways in which they are? But uh, I think that's a, a, maybe a, a topic for a different, a different time. So maybe let's leave it there for now. Thank you, Susan. Again, if anyone has any questions about this, we'll, we'll happily return to expand on, 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 this, um, on this at the end. Okay, so, three, mid-2016, uh, the Glucksman Gallery, Cork City, Ireland. An art gallery, how quaint and old-fashioned that feels now. How very naive that place and space were once so open to us. Ironic now also the title of the exhibition. I went to the woods, the artist as wanderer. In the words of curator Chris Clark, exploring how artists have experienced and portrayed their surroundings in the course of walks, journeys and ramblings. It explores the idea of the drifter, nomad and traveller, 
who captures the external environment through the careful observation of their surroundings and the collection of materials, objects and images. Another quote in here as well at this stage. Our entanglements are thus never not temporary, local assemblies of motivation, interest, people and machinery. Our own knowledge practices will also, of course, be bound up with specific entanglements. One piece caught my attention, Knetsberg Winter Journal by Dutch artist Herman de Vries. It's entirely appropriate that, um, that my name appeared earlier, Felix, in partly in lowercase. Uh, de Vries writes his name entirely in lowercase to avoid hierarchy. Um, this piece consists of a series of framed assemblages of plants, leaves, stems, moss soil, other organic matter, collected during the artist's trips into the Black Forest close to his home in Germany. This framing of dead leaves and plant stems seemed to ask me first and foremost to reflect on the structure and beauty of natural materials, in inverted commas, that would usually be ignored or paid only idle attention as we step through and over them in autumn. There's also a sense of a past moment in time, captured, preserved, literally framed. The detritus of autumn will usually decay and return to the soil, but not these specimens. That prime moment in the woods originally belonged to the artist, but with the plant stem leaves, stems and leaves, I imagine a fragment of that past time and place. However, what seems to resonate strongly was how the frame that held the autumnal leaves brought to mind the sense of time stopped down, sorry, stopped or at the very least slowed right down. The other autumnal leaves from that particular tree in that particular part of the Black Forest, a long decade, returned to the earth. These have been captured behind glass, but in time they too must disintegrate. I also realised quite quickly that one reason I was drawn to this picture was that it reminded me of one of my own photographs. Um, to be clear, this was not taken with any artistic pretensions in mind, um, but on field work um, at the Sheen Bog, County Tipperary here in Ireland. A lump of sp peat split open to demonstrate the remarkable preservation of the leaves of a Bronze Age alder tree drowned by the growth and spread of the wetland into this prehistoric woodland, a bog marginal woodland, the kind of mid Holocene ecotone that now has very few contemporary parallels. The first part, of course, of peatland environment, environments to be affected by clearance, drainage and agriculture, an environment now very much in need of imagination. Fruit trees jostling for space with alder, oak, hazel. Hurdle trackways, Iron Age, many of wood felled in the autumn for harvesting the fruit perhaps. Others stretching off into pools of Sushusaria palustris, and that's a difficult word to say. Rannock rush, collected perhaps for thatch, flooring, weaving, other affordances now long forgotten. Many anthes, bog bean, reeds. Other remains in the peat. Fragments of non-humans, microscopic to macroscopic. The beetles, Prostomis mandibularis an insect associated with rotten wood, often oak. The work of paleontologist, the late Dr. Eileen Riley, the late Dr. Vil Caspari, peatland scientist, both much missed, surviving in heart and memory, their creativity recalled, eliminated in these lines of flight. To Sherry Palustris. Extinct now, other than the peatland in Scotland from which it takes its common name, and Prostomis, Ironically, a victim of the tiding urge of humanity, grubbed out woodlands, little place for the rotting wood that this earthvelt relict beetle inhabits, inhabited. Extinctions, the unmistakable calling card of some human cultures at least. Peat cutting coming to an end in Ireland, perhaps a pyrrhic victory. Most bogs are tapped out, the archaeological record largely erased with it. Um, talking of, of, of driftings and coincidences, earlier this week, um, myself and Rosie were on a call to colleagues in Glasgow, including Claire Wilsden, and we were talking about um, art and artistic representation. And this, um, Claire showed this image, and straight away, dawn on Rannoch, the Rannoch rush. I thought I must must show this. So there it is, a beautiful, beautiful image by David Young Cameron. 
we are compelled by the promise of digressions, transgressions, mistakes, and the subterranean existence of not as yet played out narratives. Fitzgerald and Callard again. I love this, I like this conceptualization of entanglements, digressions, transgressions, narratives yet to be framed. There are many articulations, values, valences, approaches to our interactions with other disciplines, um, of which we could discuss all day. Um, the only thing I would say, I think at all costs, we must avoid what myself and Susie coined a couple of years ago as the missing piece model of discipline interactions, whereby we feel we can come along whatever our disciplinary expertise and kind of somehow slot into a gap that we've perceived in um, other disciplines. I think we must very much avoid that at all costs. How we do that is a different issue. Okay. To close. So what's the point? Castle Freak Woods, uh, West Cork. Now, if you like, if you can think of it now. Standing or most probably fallen over in, Cas fallen over in Castle Freak Woods, a group of carved wooden figurines just off the main path, close enough to be spotted by a keen pair of eyes. The product of a wood carving workshop held a year previously, exploring ideas around craft, creativity, and focusing, or at least drawing for inspiration on the anthropomorphic wooden figurines that are found in peat bogs across Europe, such as this one, the Bronze Age uh, Rallahan figurine from Ireland. A guerrilla deposition in the woods of our car figurines uh, with a view to what? Nothing, other than to release them into the wild. Uh -huh. Nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. Okay, um, ephemeral value. Value that we can't, or even better, are not compelled to measure or to capture. The steady development of a desire line off the path and up to the figurines. Certainly visited them, probably by families out for a walk, for a popular and easy path through the woods. Perhaps a talking point on the walk, maybe later over dinner. What, who, why? Perhaps forgotten. Perhaps. We don't know, but the desire lines are enough to show interest, engagement, however brief and passing. Ephemeral value, that which gleefully escapes the archive, scattering itself in a filigree of traces. We shouldn't be afraid that our engagement might sometimes just be a distraction. Thank you.